Well, I've had mixed reviews to my anthems, but I, I, I think this is a goodie for you because your book, well, it should be a South African classic. It's called Countdown to Socialism. Why did, sorry, before, before, shall I give you your, what AI says about you? John, I couldn't hear Anthea. Let's just make sure that the mic's working first. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthea Jeffrey, a distinguished member of the Institute of Race Relations. As a leading expert in policy analysis, Dr. Jeffrey has dedicated her career to advocating for economic freedom, property rights, and the rule of law. Her insightful research and publications have significantly contributed to the national dialogue on democracy, governance, and social justice. Dr. Jeffrey's work continues to influence policymaking and public discourse across the nation. Let's extend a warm welcome to Dr. Anthea Jeffrey. Thanks, Dan. Why did you write Countdown to Socialism? And I say this because it's it's explosive stuff in there. If anybody uh, in the Kremlin were reading it, for instance, uh, I think they would be pretty un, unhappy uh, given their ambitions for South Africa. And we know that they can be pretty nasty in what they do. So so what, what motivated you to write this this book and basically tell all? I suppose it really began because I wrote People's War. And when I joined the Institute in 1990, I was very naive and I didn't know a lot about politics. And I was astonished to discover more and more evidence that the ANC was involved in violence, that the sort of comfortable notion that we, many of us had, that it was the National Party government and its Encarta surrogate that were to blame. That wasn't true. There was a whole other aspect to the violence which involved the ANC and how they had learned to use a very ruthless form of violence in order to eliminate and weaken their main black rivals. So, having written the book on that, I was very intrigued as to what they then did with the state power which they acquired. And the answer was that they were implementing the National Democratic Revolution. And that had been the whole point of the People's War. If the ANC had just been one political party out of others, then it wouldn't have enough uh, hegemony when it came to power to be able to implement the National Democratic Revolution. You needed really to eliminate all contestants for power for a significant period while you carried on with this incremental program aimed at socialism over time. So it was the next part of the story. And I felt very, very driven, I guess, to write it up. Where are you from? What part of the country are you from? Johannesburg. And so it plays it in, you didn't like have a, uh, a, a, a burning desire to expose what was going on in the area that you grew up, if you're from Johannesburg. What, what pulled you into that kind of politics? Was it just because it was so explosive? I suppose it was that, you know, um, because when I began working for the Institute, it was 1990, it was a long time ago, but political violence was increasing. And this was at a time when the ANC had been unbanned, when we stood on the cusp of constitutional negotiations for a democratic South Africa, and yet the violence intensified three times from what it had been in the late 1980s. So this was an important issue to investigate. And as I said, from my rather naive assumptions about who must be to blame, I had the opportunity to read enough, to think enough, um, to to have insight really into some very useful books. And in those days, the media used to give you more information. You might have to go to page 10, but you could actually find information about incidents that were out of the way, that didn't get much coverage. But as you built up a picture of, of it was like building a puzzle. You got a little bit here, a little bit there. All the emphasis of the media was on certain events that fitted the third force theory. But there were all these other events which didn't. And I became intrigued by it, and I wanted to see more and more of the puzzle. And in the end, I felt I did have a clear picture of it, which I wrote up. And then the next phase was the National Democratic Revolution, the use of state power in order to propel us down the path to socialism. So this is all a plan. 
Absolutely, yes. That the ANC was determined to have this control, that its Soviet partner, as it was for many years, wanted the ANC to have this control so that um, it could do what the Soviet Union was, was pressing many other newly uh, independent colonies to do, to move from the capitalist systems which they had inherited from the colonial power to a socialist system. Um, it was a theory that they went all the way back to 1905 um, with Lenin's view of, of the first and then the second stage of a revolution. But in the 1950s, the Soviet Union had put a lot of effort into refining it. What in practice could you do to move from the capitalist stage to the socialist stage? And the answer was that you needed a lot of anti-capitalist transformation and that there were various issues which you could use for that purpose. Uh, that in South Africa, because of the history of apartheid, because of the land injustice, you could move, move more quickly to tackling property rights and undermining property rights. But the other great uh, kind of umbrella in which you could cause a great deal of damage was the notion of demographic representativity. The idea that everybody would just ban out into business, into society, into the ownership of every asset, into every school, university, etc., in accordance with their share of the population. And if that wasn't happening, then the only explanation could be continued race discrimination. And that's a nonsense, of course. Um, and I was interested to read a, a book by Yuri Bezhmanov, uh, who was a defector from the KGB in, in the 1980s. We just laugh. He wrote a book called Love Letter to America, in which he was trying to explain the kind of strategies that are used against Soviet Union, as it was then, enemies. And demographic representativity was one of the key ones. Because he said, of course, not everybody's the same. And we all know that if we stop and think about it. But it, it's, a, it's a kind of easy idea to seed that there's a norm of demographic representativity. That there's, if there's an aberration from it, this requires state intervention to correct it. It's the justification here for all the employment equity and BEE rules which have caused so much damage. And ironically, the well, South African Communist Party is well aware of, of how absurd the outcomes have been because they say we can see that inequality has increased and it's increased primarily within the black population because there's a small proportion that benefit from employment equity and BEE and all the rest. And the great majority who have no chance of taking part in those programs are hurt by the consequences. And you have a, a very rapid turnover in the bureaucracy, so state power becomes less effective. There's a degree of incompetence, a loss of institutional memory, and so the service delivery to people who depend on it crucially goes down. In the procurement sphere, you have an astonishing degree of wasted money, and they've known about it for a long time. So as the SACP says, we are creating a small band of very wealthy, empowered people at the top. And for the great majority, there is worse poverty than if we didn't have this. But it is so useful, too, at, to, at kind of tying the private sector up in knots and fueling and greasing the ANC's patronage machine that they're only too keen to keep it. So that was another of the great issues that have been used to drive the NDR forward. Property rights and demographic representativity in every sphere. Uh, I've had a, a fairly long career, and I remember around the time of 94, 95, 96, just from a, perhaps a naive perspective, quizzing business leaders, business executives on BEE. Mm -hmm. I remember getting a response from the CEO of a big bank when I said to him, but surely these share options that you're giving away to this BEE group a very small a group that you've handpicked, are costing shareholders. And this CEO at the time said, well, you don't write it off against our income statement, so no. Where, of course, it was a nonsense. Mm. In 1998, when um, EPSA had that huge deal with Tokyo Sehwali, which was just so obvious, they defended it on the basis that, but we need more people in the tent, in the, in other words, create new black capitalists. Mm. 
how did they get taken so? Because when I read your book, it's quite clear that there was a, and then you see the, the uh, court documents or the documents that the court forced the ANC to hand over because on Qatar deployment. And it's, it's so damn obvious now that these guys were, were taken for fools. And these are supposed to be very smart business leaders. Yeah, I, I think perhaps I could say in their defense that the media had something to do with it too. Um, we opposed the Employment Equity Bill when it came out in 1997, as the, the Democratic Party did at that point too. And we said that what we need is not a new form of racial engineering, but rather a growing economy um, with increasing skills development in every sphere. Because the National Party government had realized in the early 1970s that the white population was too small to meet the needs of the economy which was why from 1972 we began to get uh, real reforms to unto education, as it was called at that point, um, in terms of which some of the worst abuses were ameliorated. And it was because the skills base was too small. You had to have a bigger pool of skilled people. So it, it, was, it wasn't as if anybody in the white community was resisting uh, black people increasingly taking a, a leading role in the society it was something that obviously needed to happen politically, economically, in every way. It was the only fair and right thing to be done. But you can't achieve it by strangling the economy. You, you achieve it by making sure that your education is very good and that your economy is growing and that you use the skills that you have to best effect to make sure that that growth is as rapid as possible. But where did we go wrong? Where did, how did... And I'm saying we, as the population of South Africa, leave the media out of it because the media just reflects what the population is saying. No, no. How did, <laughs> hi, Barad, okay, you, you fixed me there, but how did we go wrong in not protesting more, perhaps? I go back to what the media said. So here we were trying to oppose it with the Institute of Race Relations since 1929. We've been advocating for non-racialism, uh, which is now in the Constitution as a founding value. And all the pushback from the media was, but this is just sound human relations. This is the kind of thing that every you know, human resources manager would automatically be doing. But it's not when it becomes a quota enforced by the government. Um, and you must also recognize that once you can see the principle that the government can really tell you what the composition of your workforce should be, what seems perhaps to be a small intervention at the beginning will inevitably get bigger and the demands will increase. And once you've conceded the principle, it's very hard to go back and say, well, well, now we don't like it. So it should have been resisted strongly by the media, by other political parties at that time. Um, and perhaps we should have taken more account of what Thomas Sowell and the, the United States has said about these sorts of policies, is that they really are, are bait-and-switch policies. In other words, you talk about the plight of the very poor as the justification for an employment equity policy, say. But of course, it's not the poor that are going to be appointed as managers in the public service or the private sector. It's going to be the, the best credential, best educated, the most advantaged people within the black population. So it's a bait with a plight of the poor and a switch to the advantage of the wealthy. And perhaps if that understanding of it had been more successfully seeded at that time, we could have resisted it more. Uh, it, it was also an era where, um, you know, we'd recently come out of the, the whole panoply of, of race-based law that apartheid had inflicted on the country for such a long time. So there was also a tremendous, I suppose, sensitivity to any idea that you were standing in the way of racial progress. And maybe that was part of why we just assumed too easily uh, that the, the ANC could do this in a sensitive way, in a sensible way, whereas in fact, of course, it was the, the thin edge of the wedge. And once you've opened up, then you do more and more until we can see just how damaging employment equity opening the way for cater deployment and other abuses has been. We had a wonderful talk here from Veliko uh, Sidi Chapisa where a big part of it, he tried to, I, w I won't say sanitize the reputation of uh, 
Prince Mangasu to put it lazy, but certainly give another view to the very popular view, which is which is pretty negative. What is your reading of, of that whole time, the whole IFP, ANC comrades and, and uh, Roy Dukka and Witt Dukka mm. uh, murders and, and, and violence? You have to go back to 1976 very briefly, the Soweto Revolt. Um, it was very exciting to the ANC because it showed that insurrection was possible. It was also very scary to the ANC and also to, to Moscow because it showed that the ANC, by then banned for decades, had was really being supplanted within the country by new black political organizations, um, by the Black Consciousness Organization, which was responsible for sparking the Soweto Revolt, not the ANC, and very much by Encarta, which was growing rapidly in strength and popularity, both in Cuisine Natal and on the reef, and which advocated uh, for nonviolent change and which was very critical of sanctions, saying that they'll just make poverty much worse. And that stance against violence and in favor of growth resonated with the black population far more than the idea that there should be conflict and suffering through sanctions. So Butelezi was growing fast, particularly after the failure of the Soweto Revolt, showed that you couldn't really get very far by having children out on the street and, and being shut down by the police. So it was scary. And so in 1978, the Soviet Union basically sent a senior delegation of ANC, mostly SAC people, to Vietnam to learn the principles, the formula for people's war from General Vaughan Zapp, who had really distilled a whole lot of revolutionary theory into a fairly simple formula for you have to have the political struggle on the one hand, you have to have the military struggle, the program of violence on the other hand. They must always interact. You crush your adversaries between the two. And the critical thing about Vietnam was it showed how you could crush your political rivals. It's one thing to act against the incumbent government, that clearly you must do. But if you are going to be the dominant party by the time there's a change of regime, then you must destroy we can eliminate, stigmatize your internal rivals. And the great value of the People's War formula was that it provided um, really a mechanism by which you could do that. And it, it really is very simple uh, in the sense that you do a lot of organization, a lot of propaganda, bring in a lot of weapons, bring in a lot of, of money, and then you start with a small level of attack but you can increase it and increase it. And whenever there is violence, you blame your opponent for having caused it so that you turn the truth on its head and you deflect blame from yourself, put it on others. And that really is very much what happened to Butelezi and Encarto. They were heavily attacked, um, particularly from 1987 onwards in the Peter Maritzburg area, uh, within, by the time the ANC was unbanned in early 1990, that there'd been about 3,000 deaths in Kwasit and Natal. The bulk of those deaths were among in Carter people, but it was not what most people understood, because if you looked at the media coverage, it was almost always about in Carter going on the rampage in some way, which they did, which was obviously unacceptable behavior. But they went in that rampage when there had been all these individual assassinations, um, incidents where a, you know, a homestead would be surrounded and, at night and, and petrol bombs thrown into it, and then all the people inside it would obviously be come. And as they stumbled out into the dark, they would be shot dead by people waiting for them with AK-47s. But that was never given much coverage. What you did get much coverage of was a big counterattack. So it was easy increasingly to portray Encarta and Butelezi as the ones who were causing all violence. And in the early 1990s, when the ANC used the negotiations peace process to bring back all its exiles, including therefore 13,000 members of Encarta who had been trained and armed and who they did not disband or, dis or disarm once they were back in the country, you had an upsurge of violence. And it was very much against the IFP, 
very much against what was left of BC and the PAC and against the police. Um, and then you had an upsurge of propaganda as well, which blamed all of this violence on the IFP and on de Klerk, on the third force working to disrupt negotiation. But one of the things that they'd learned in Vietnam was the formula for negotiations too. You must use negotiations as a terrain of struggle. So as negotiations begin, you must intensify the people's war in all its phases. You must have an upsurge in mass action because that's terribly destabilizing. And so we got things like the bath strike. You must have an upsurge in violence. And so we got now a five-fold increase in the deaths. And you must have an upsurge in the propaganda which blames it all on your enemy. And you must decline to enter into any real negotiations until the very last moment. So here we had no real negotiation, negotiations from 1990 through to about May 1993. It was only after the assassination of Chris Harney when the National Party government agreed to an election date, and now you had this completely immovable deadline and no agreement on the Constitution, on any of the legislation that you would need to guide the transition. Only at that late stage, and in fact from about September onwards, did you get any real negotiation. And by then, it was so late in the day, and it was so obviously vital that you couldn't postpone the election, that people made concessions that they might otherwise have avoided. And that was a lesson that came straight from Vietnam and what they had learned from Xiao. If we fast forward from there, and it's a wonderful background that you've given us, and your, your book is, as I said, it should be a South African classic, just to open eyes, and we get to where we are now, this, this plan that was clearly very well put together should have died when the Soviet Union ended, the, the end of history, Francis Kiyama's book in 1992, and yet it didn't. If anything, it seemed to have accelerated. Why? I think so that the primary reason is that there were so many other socialist organizations. Um, there was still the Socialist International. There are a number of very left-leaning academics all over the world, various countries. And they somehow convinced themselves that socialism had never been tried. I mean, this has been mentioned a couple of times at this conference. But this was really the justification that was used. And Joe Slover was one of the first people out of the blocks to say, has socialism failed? Uh, he wrote an article about it in November 1989, just about the same time as, as the Berlin Wall came down. And he said, no, not at all, because what happened in the Soviet Union was this completely bizarre thing. They got a bureaucratic, cure, sorry, excuse me, bureaucratic and commandist system which took away from democratic socialism, which is what all of us want. So what they did there was wrong, but irrelevant. Real socialism hasn't been tried, and we will get it right when we do it. And then you also had a kind of reorientation of the concept of socialism, whereas initially it had been very much that, you know, you must have the party that's in charge of the, of the means of production and distribution and exchange, that's now completely played down. And you get uh, Chris Harney as, as the general secretary of the SACP in the early 1990s saying socialism is all about human rights. It's about making sure that there is decent housing for people who don't have it. It's about making sure that there's health care and good education and that the old are looked after and so on. And he painted a picture of this benign government that just wants to do its best to look after people. And that's what socialism is about. Um, and so I think you also had an increasing anti-capitalism focus, which has used perhaps uh, two key themes. The one is that capitalism creates a huge amount of inequality. And it is true that when you have growth, you will find some growing fast, growing more quickly than others. There will be a widening of inequality. But it doesn't matter if everybody is becoming more prosperous. It's, it's kind of the wrong issue to focus on, but useful. 
to say that this is a fine, fundamental flaw of capitalism. And the other was very much the environmental argument that capitalism is so intensely focused on growth at all costs that they're willing to destroy the planet and their desire for this. And then an increasing theme also coming out is that under, under capitalism, you will see this emphasis on profits, whereas what you need is an emphasis on people, uh, which may sound very attractive to many, but of course, no capitalism can, capitalist can make a profit unless what he or she produces has value in the market, that people are willing to pay for it. And that aspect of it is completely forgotten in this kind of analysis, that capitalism will spawn inequality, it will destroy the planet, and it's not caring about people in the way that socialism is. Which is astonishing when you think about the 100 million people killed in socialist countries. But as the memory of those 100 million deaths has faded, so this kind of packaging of socialism has become more and more credible, particularly to the young. And so I think it is disturbing that uh, increasingly opinion polling is showing that young people aged 18 to 34 have a great interest. In fact, they, they value socialism and many think that it is better than, than capitalism and that their lives would be improved if their countries turn more clearly to socialism. And, and this came out, for example, in a, an opinion poll that was done in late 2022 in the US, the UK, uh, Australia, and Canada. The US is not as, as strong, but even in the US it is going that way, particularly among the young and particularly among Democrats. And the other countries, this belief that socialism will be good. And when uh, the, the people ask, conducting the poll said, well, what's your understanding of socialism? It's not at all that the ruling party controls the economy. It's Harney's vision. It's that the government then takes care of everybody. Uh, and that is, has been the great success of this great, the sort of socialist international and all the people who retained their socialist beliefs after the Soviet Union disbanded and are increasingly able to shift the narrative in these ways. And now, as we see in the States, also to the idea of equity, they call it. We become used to it as demographic representativity. There must be equal outcomes for different groups. And that is now really, bec it's becoming very powerful in the US under the influence of critical race theory. And it means that we in South Africa are trying to fight back against the notion of demographic representativity are now likely to be told, but even in the US, they recognize there's a need for equity. Um, so it, it's made the job of really mounting and, and waging the battle of ideas more tricky but perhaps also um, as the inherent unworkability of this idea comes more to the, the fore, there may be a wider group of people that can work together to oppose it. Well, that would be the, the message of hope. Yeah. And that here in South Africa, we've seen that these ideas don't work. We, we know, I, I think um, there was a, a mention today about Phil Craig. He said that... The Western Cape last year had three, 33 days load shedding free. Mm -hmm. Now, surely if that doesn't ring a bell in somebody's head, <laughs> uh, what else will? Could that be, I'm looking for a glimmer of hope here, could that be maybe on the upside that, yeah, the guys who put the National Democratic Revolution plan together must have been real smart, and they had a plan and they've implemented it, but it hasn't worked and we can see the practical consequences of it. Mm -hmm. I think there is scope for fight back. I think that in the U.S. it's happening primarily at the level of concerned parents because critical race theory is being introduced in schools. And it really is a pernicious notion uh, that children should be taught that if their skins are white, they are automatically oppressors. And if their skins are black, then they're automatically victims. It's pernicious on both sides. Um, and think that in a strange way, the COVID-19 lockdown had one good effect in that many American parents became more aware of what their children were being taught and they were pretty disturbed. So there is now a big push 
against CRT in the schools, against CRT at the universities, um, against CRT in the federal government, which is now, of course, uh, more difficult to achieve. Um, Trump obviously opened a very number of criticisms, but one of the things he did do that was positive to say, we're not going to have diversity, equity, and inclusion training in the federal government that involves people being told that they fall into these camps, either oppressor or victim, and that's it. Um, the Democratic Party is very much in favor of it, so they bring it back. But at the grassroots level, there is a resistance now to that idea and uh, a resistance to, I think, what is being seen as um, the absurdity of trying to force this model in every sphere, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in the composition of orchestras, whether it's in who gets stuck a star in a Hollywood movie. It, it kind of just seems so forced, so unnatural if you insist on the quotas in every sphere. So there, there is resistance developing there, but there's also cancel culture. <laughs> so you can be silenced, you can lose your job for speaking out. Um, so we have allies, potentially. We have, I think, lessons from how demographic representativity doesn't work. Uh, we, of course, have a particular, also, uh, the, the way in which our population is structured is different from that of the U.S., uh, where it may be easier to think that, well, if you're aiming at, at 14, 15% quota for a particular group, maybe it's not so damaging as, as it is when you're taking people who were never given the opportunity for decent education and saying that they must be represented at the 80% level from every sphere of, of the workplace down whether it's the board, whether it's top management, middle management, and so on, which clearly isn't workable when you don't have the skills, you don't have the experience, you don't have the institutional memory. Um, so potential allies, but also a lot of focus being placed around the world on equity being the norm, equality being something that we've recognize that it's too limited because it's a quality of opportunity. So yeah, it's a mixed picture. There's some good and, and there's also more challenge. What about the future from here? You've got such deep insights into what brought us to where we are today. When one tries to impose an artificial system, eventually it has to, it has to not uh, be, well, it has to be kicked out. So how are you seeing South Africa this election and mm -hmm. thereafter? I really wish <laughs> that this election could mean the end of all these crazy policies. Um, but I'm afraid that I, I agree with Bill. I also did the calculation. You know, if the recent opinions are polls are wrong, then what happens if you put the EFF, the ANC and the MK party together and you get to over 60% full? people who all agree absolutely on the NDR. Uh, as uh, Cyril Ramaphosa said in 2022, there are no divisions within the ANC on ideology or policy. There are big divisions about who gets what post um, and, you know, the benefits that go with that. But on ideology, we are all agreed, and that's 100% correct. So the, you know, the, the sort of fallacy that... So Ramaphosa is a reformer who's been fighting off the RET faction is, is a nonsense. They all agree on ideology. So we face the prospect that those people will agree in order to keep moving the revolution forward, no matter how much they might fight about who gets what post. There's too much at stake. So how can we resist it? And... Um, and perhaps what we need to look at is at the provincial level, because I think that the opinion polling has been showing quite clearly that the ANC is unlikely to win Ha Teng, unlikely to win Kwasi Natal, though the MK party now is a bit of a complication in that, um, and certainly unlikely to win the Western Cape. So if there are three major provinces 
that are now not run by the ANC, but by a coalition. Maybe this is the time when we can start using the Constitution, because black economic empowerment, for example, particularly as it's applied to business, is against the Constitution. The Constitution commits us as a founding value to non-racialism, which is inconsistent with race classification and race targets. The Constitution says that we must have broad representativity in the public administration. But broad representativity is not the same as the kind of arithmetical quotas that we're becoming used to. And you know, that the, the, the target for, for black representation is 79.2%. Uh, broad representativity is different. Critically, it's only in the public administration. There is nothing in the Constitution that obliges business to apply employment equity or BEE. When it comes to preferential procurement, we have Section 217 of the Constitution, which deals with public procurement. And it says that public procurement by state entities must be efficient, cost-effective, competitive, transparent, all these good values. And then it goes on to say this does not prevent state entities from applying preferences if they choose by implication. It's not obligatory at all. So it's high time to start using the actual wording of the Constitution. And then people will say to me, well, what about Section 9.2, which makes some provision for affirmative action, which it does, measures to advance the disadvantage. But there I think we need to rely on what the Constitutional Court said in the Van Heerden case back in 2004. They said that remedial measures... Um, shouldn't be presumed to be invalid, but they must pass three tests if we're to accept them. If they're to be race-based, and we have this non-racial constitution, then they must pass three tests. They must target the disadvantage, they must open up opportunities for them, and they must achieve equality. And we can show that not one of those tests is being met, because the people that they target are the 15% or well, the relative elite within the black population. The ordinary, the great majority, are not being advanced in any way through these policies. They're being enormously prejudiced, partly because state services are collapsing, partly because investment has been so put off by all this complexity and the ever ratcheting up rules. And so we have this high level of employment. So the second test is not met. And the third one, achieving equality. Well, the SACP itself has said BEE is the reason why we have worse inequality now than we did in 1994, because the small group benefits and the great masses do not. So we can also say that Section 9.2 does not provide a justification for these policies. And if we had uh, provincial administrations as well as the private sector say we're going to go with what the Constitution says, it provides opportunities to fight back. So you've given us some, some uh, ammunition there. Uh, this time has really flown, and I don't want to leave it without going into the core of the NDR, where it came from, and that dot being joined through to Mr. Putin and the Kremlin. We, we're hearing all kinds of information that he is behind the funding of MK, that he is involved, or at least the Kremlin's involved, in South African politics. First of all, is that a, is that a rational um, thought? And secondly, if there is no more Soviet Union, why would Putin be following a Soviet plan? Um, yes, I, I think that it's, it's difficult, obviously, to see into his mind. But I think we must take seriously his belief that the disbandment of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy that ever befell that Russian Federation, which is pretty much has the same boundaries as the Soviet Union. And therefore, he has a, an ambition to, I think, restore the glory of the Soviet Union as it was and to begin to take back parts of the old empire, um, beginning with Ukraine. I think I have no information about whether he is funding MK, but I think that Russia and China, which have just declared now this great friendship and alliance, are certainly very keen for the ANC to remain in power. 
And I think it's interesting to recognize that there is now in Tanzania a political school set up and run very much with the help of, of the Chinese Communist Party, which is very conscious that the six liberation movements in Southern Africa must all remain in power. So, and this was obviously being discussed, I mean, it was reported on in the Daily Maverick, saying that they were all developing a strategy as to how, first of all, they could make sure that ZANU-PF would retain power in the Zimbabwean election last year, and that the ANC would retain power here, and uh, uh, SWAPO would retain power in Namibia. Uh, so again, what you're seeing is evidence of the East, as it were, alliance between the Russians and the Chinese, and always this network of socialist-leaning parties that lend their ideas, lend their experience, put all their, their heads together, as it were, to provide the best possible ideas from their point of view to maintain their allies in power here. So aren't we being a little naive then by just dismissing the notion of independence for the Western Cape? <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I think that independence for the Western Cape, if it could be achieved, would be something enormously valuable um, because there would be within the original boundary of South Africa a real possibility of change, a, a different system that shows the potential for the rest of the country, if it's still under the yoke of the ANC, to try and get rid of that yoke. Um, but I don't know that it's easily attainable at all. The con it, obviously, the constitution would have to be changed. When there was talk earlier today about you would you know, have the referendum and then use that to negotiate with the ANC, the ANC are path masters of negotiation and at using negotiations as a terrain of struggle. So it wouldn't be sitting down in good faith to reach an outcome that you then stick to. The other thing about negotiations as a terrain of struggle is that you will make concessions if you have to in order to get to an outcome which gets you, say, 70% of the way that you want. And your view is no agreement that you make is ever binding on you. It's just a tactical concession that you make at a particular time. The moment the balance of forces has shifted and you can abandon it, you will. So to negotiate with an organization that has this kind of set of, of, huh, of uh, I was going to say principles, perspectives, is a very difficult thing to do particularly if you are a little naive and you do want to negotiate in good faith and you believe that when you shake on a deal, that's that, you're bound by it. You're dealing with people for whom a completely different set of values applies. So we've been uh, fighting, or many people in South Africa have been fighting uh, according to the rules mm. and the adversaries are in a street fight. You've gone in with boxing gloves and the other guy's gone in with a truncheon. In a nutshell, yes. Yeah, and of course, it's not easy to fight that kind of fire with fire because you, you want to retain your principles. But you do at least need to be aware of what you're up against um, and try and expose the tactic, the, uh, falling over my tongue, the, the techniques and the tactics that are being used by the other side. I, I, I like to finish on some area of hope so that we can actually go back to bed tonight and, and sleep well. <laughs> yes. Uh, you, you, you did give us some hope on the Constitution or using the Constitution to, to fight back mm -hmm. on this side for, for people who believe the opposite to what the ANC and the, and the old Soviets believe. Is there anything else? Do you see any other upside in, in the scenario that you've made it for us? I, th I think, again, if we, if we end up with three provincial administrations which are not under ANC control, um, they can certainly push back against the, the, the whole notion of demographic representativity. They can try to uphold property rights within their sphere. I th there's also a possibility of using what the Constitution says, that the areas of concurrent power between national and provincial government include a number of really important areas, including healthcare, including education. And I've certainly seen it argued that 
the provinces could push more to say that this is what needs to be done. And particularly in the context where the national government is increasingly inept and unable to provide the goods and services that people need. Um, you know, the, the test is that in the concurrent powers, the national must be able to prevail where it's in the national interest. Well, now I think you can begin to argue that it's in people's interest as the national fails for the provinces to take more and more. And that, again, is an argument that could be used within the constitution because you don't want to break its parameters uh, to really kind of try and show the different model. The, the DA has done a bit of it perhaps with the charter school idea here in the Western Cape. Um, but that could be taken further to try and, and, and break the sort of stranglehold of Satu and uh, rather uncaring officials and teachers over many dysfunctional schools. If you got the charter school model working more generally, if you went perhaps a little bit further to say, hoping that you don't get retaliation on your equitable share, that we are in charge of the education budget here in the, in the Western Cape. And we think it would be a much better idea to say have education vouchers, which are used in many different countries where the money follows the pupil as it were. So you have the, the education budget and you say, we're not just letting the bureaucrats re retain control of that. We will take most of that money and turn it into a voucher for low income parents to give them the possibility to choose the school that they want for their child so that every school has to start competing for the customer of those parents. So that the public schools where those vouchers can be taken to must now actually be good, otherwise they're going to be abandoned. And you'll see many more independent schools springing up too to meet the need. And again, you can just begin to break the model of complete dependency on the state to provide and have an illustration of how a competitive, innovative private sector can do so much better. So the message that you're sending to another strong woman, Helen Ziller, who's been at this conference, is come on, Helen, just push the envelope. Get those guys on the, uh, in, the, in the province to, to get, even, get a lot more aggressive. And that seems to be something that we've come, that's coming out of this conference more and more, that there is scope to not sit back and let the guy with the truncheon keep beating you when you, you're trying to hit him back with boxing gloves. But in fact, to retaliate, perhaps not in kind, but at least more aggressive. I think we should use what the Constitution says. You know, we, it, we, for far too long, we've kind of gone along with the way in which the ANC has reinterpreted the actual words in the Constitution. Um, and in an environment where the ANC is clearly incapable of meeting people's needs, it's time to push for the provinces with their concurrent powers and in Swarton spheres, that they are going to use those powers for the best interests of the people within them, right, province. Matthew, Jeffrey, it's been such a pleasure talking with you tonight. Thank you. Thanks for your advice.